Welcome to Rightly Dividing the Word of Truth from Bethel Christian Fellowship in Lakewood, Colorado, where Pastor Gary Belk is providing a verse-by-verse, in-depth analysis of the book of Ephesians, where we're learning about who we are in Christ Jesus. Let's listen in. Our precious Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning because, first of all, we recognize that you love us. And Father, without your love, I just don't know what I would do. Father, without your comforting Holy Spirit in my life, I would just be a mess. So, Father, this morning we just thank you for sending your Son and allowing us to have a right relationship with you through him. For him being obedient even unto death so that, again, we can have this this possible in our lives today. Father, we just ask that you uh, reach out um, today to Luis in the hospital and just comfort her and Strengthen her, dear Holy Father. Let the doctors make all the right decisions, and we'll just give you the praise, honor, and glory in that sense. Help Brother Willie over there in the assisted living. Touch him as well. Father, we just ask that you help Dan at home today. He's not feeling well. You know all about it. Father, strengthen him. Take this upset stomach and this sickness away. And We also ask that you help Sherry at home. Father, just touch her in the name of Jesus Christ. Touch the rest of us. We all have this human body, and you're well aware of what that means. So just touch us. We all have these aches and pains, and and just be with us and guide us and give us the strength that we need to be the person that we need to be so that others can hear the gospel, the good news, in the name of Jesus. We'll give you the praise, honor, and glory as we study your word this morning. Amen. Well, last year, all of last year, we talked about Ephesians. We made it kind of like halfway through. And that's simply because I like going slow. Um, when I was young, I went fast. And I missed, missed a lot of stuff. You know, I didn't take time to stop and, so, so to speak, smell the roses, so to speak, in that sense. And now, I li- what I like to do with the Word of God, I like to read a little bit about chew on it a little bit, digest it, comprehend it, contemplate on it, see how it's applicable in my life. Um, You know, just slow down and and try to comprehend everything that God has for us. And we're all aware of the fact that when we read Scripture, we can read it once, and then two weeks later we can come back and read that same portion, and, and it has this unique, special, brand new meaning for us. And that God kind of like opens our eyes to a better understanding or interpretation. Not that our interpretation was wrong to begin with, but just a more thorough, and, and sometimes a light bulb turns on, or you just, wow, I never saw that before, see. And, um, and so, you know, I, I used to be able to study all week, do about a four-point sermon, and then preach a four-point sermon, and everybody says, oh, that was good, and what was that all about? You know, because it was just too much information, and you feel, you feel compelled to try to get it all out. All right? And I just, anymore, I just love meditating and studying the Word of God and just allowing God to feed me through that process. And I was thinking about what we did last year. I mean, we started this, this study, this um, exegetical study on Ephesians, which means just digesting, tearing it apart, looking at every word, looking at all the various concepts that God has recorded through the Apostle Paul for us to, to know. And we found out that we were in Christ. And that the way you get in Christ is not by somehow winning the lottery or knowing somebody special. It's by saying yes to God. Amen? Amen. And then once you say yes, it, 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 the analogy I used was it's like getting employed by a certain company. And once you're employed by this company, Debbie, they bring you in and they give you orientation day. And so we had orientation year last year orientation and it and and they start telling you about what your benefits are as an employee and those are your benefits as long as you remain an employee now 
If for whatever reason you choose not to be an employee, well, then those benefits go away. And as Christians, we have benefits, do we not? We do. We've got benefits. And the first chapter of Ephesians told us those benefits. They talked about the provisions of spiritual blessings that we have and the fact that we have a right relationship with God and we can have peace in our life in reference to that. We can know that we know that we know that we know, Brother Fred, that if I should die tonight, I'll be in his presence. Amen? Amen. We, we know that God is for us, not against us. You know, he, God doesn't stack odds against us. God doesn't go to Vegas and say, I bet Dwayne's going to fail this week. You know, that's so cool, right? All right? And then we, the basis of those blessings is basically the fact that Jesus made made the provision. It's because of Jesus. Amen? It's because of his obedience entirely. Never having chosen to, in his free will, be disobedience. He, he did what we call, he satisfied the righteous requirements of a holy God. And, and God has chosen in his plan to, and he has a right to do this because why? He's creator. And, it, and his plan doesn't somehow uh, contradict his character. It's in line with his character. It's not in, in opposition with his character. God, is, God can do all things that are possible. Now, you said, well, I thought God could do all things. I said, no, God can't lie. <laughs> okay? It's not possible for God to lie. So God can do all possible things. Things, all things that are possible, God can possibly do them. He just can't lie because that would be um, against His nature. Exactly right. And so, what we're learning in Scripture is His is His revelation of Himself to us, as recorded via man, and as as we talked about in credentials. I feel very confident this morning that what I have. In my Bible, is truthful about the truth. Does that make sense? It's truthful about the truth. So when John three sixteen says, "For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son," I know that's truthful about what God did. And so when when we read first chapter of Ephesians, we find out that we're in Christ. We have these spiritual blessings. We found out the basis for those spiritual blessings. And then the uniqueness, and I still remember that prayer that the Apostle Paul read for the Ephesians. And he says, I pray that the God, in, in, it's in chapter 117, I pray that God gives you the spirit of wisdom and the revelation of the knowledge <coughs> of him. And what a beautiful prayer. He's, he's in, you know, it, it's totally different than some of our prayers this day and age. It's, I, I pray that God gives you a, a new Harley. Okay, well, okay, I'm up for that, God. But that's not what it was. Okay. It, it, the prayer there was for something that was tangible, something that was meaningful, something that was enduring, something that's everlasting. The spirit of wisdom. I always can use the spirit of wisdom. Amen? And having the spirit of wisdom has, um, on many, many occasions, kept me out of trouble. Out of trouble. Um, and then we also need the revelation of the knowledge of him. And, and that's what we have here. The revelation of the knowledge of him. And the more you read, the more you know, and the more you know, the more you want to know. And the more you know, better. Does that all make sense? And so we, we, we listened to that prayer, and that was my prayer for each and every one of us, including myself. And then, then we found out that our status in life when we accept Christ has changed. We're no longer sons of disobedience, but we're children of God. I, I, again, this week, I had somebody says, well, we're all of God's children. 
And I said, no, we're all a part of God's creation, but not all of us are part of his, we're not all his children. Those who have accepted Jesus Christ are his children. Those that haven't accepted remain sons of disobedience. And I really believe that there, there's a significant difference between the two. And it shows up in one's behavior, okay? Right. It shows up. And as sons of disobedience, we follow the, the prince and the power of this heir, the, the one who's, you know, in, in, the, in the ways of this wicked world. And um, it was me against you. And um, if for whatever reason I started losing, I would lie, cheat, and steal just to somehow win. And all behavior, whether it was productive or counterproductive, it was on the table. It was there for the taking. And, uh, you know, I didn't live my life because I loved you. I lived my life because I was selfish of what you had, and I did what I could do to take it away from you, or at least get what you, similar to what you had. And th that relationship in the world is not love, it's selfishness. And when you really stop and think about it, how true is that? You look around, people are selfish. And, and we can't bring that into the kingdom. And then, so we had this relationship before as unbelievers with the world, and we acted as the world acts in selfishness. And then we accepted Jesus Christ, and we became children of God, and we started learning about God and how God wants us to be like his son, etc. We We have that perfect example as far as the recording and the eyewitnesses of how Jesus reacted and how Jesus acted, etc. And, and, and we found out that we're no longer in the world, but we're in the kingdom. And, and then we brought out the fact that what we used to do and how we used to do it in the kingdom doesn't work, or excuse me, in the world doesn't work in the kingdom. Okay? And we, we've got to have new tools and new ways of doing things. And once we were dead and now we're alive and then, then, then we looked at this mystery that the Apostle Paul said that he had been given this gospel, this certain grace to preach, <laughs> to preach unto the Gentiles, and and how the how the curtain in the in the in the temple, the holy of holies, was rent in two when when Jesus Christ was was crucified, and how he brought how where the Jewish individuals and, and, and people were the chosen people and, and God had revealed himself to them but now through this whole process he's going to reveal himself to the Gentiles as well and they too can be brought in and the two have been made one so to speak and there's unity there and we started this con actually the entire book the entire book of Ephesians is, is who you are in Christ but it's also about unity the unity, okay, as individuals not <clears throat> having accepted Jesus Christ, we are not in unity with God, are we? We're at enmity. We're at odds. We're, 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 God is not our friend. He's our foe. And so the first thing to do, Brother Duane, is to get right with God so that we can have peace with God and we can be in unity with God. And then, and then this, this gospel was, was preached now not only to, to the Jews. Remember, the gospel is the power of God unto salvation, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. The gospel, the good news, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And so there was, this, there was this bringing together of humanity, so to speak. Because either you're Jewish or you're Gentile. It's just, you know... There's no other way around it, okay? And then, so there was this unity within, within the revelation of God to man uh, that we, we talked about. And Gentiles are now, have the ability through the, through the grace of God to participate in God's plan of salvation, which is what we call grace. And we studied that union, the consequences of it. We looked at that mystery, the consequences of it. And we discussed Paul's prayer for the Ephesians to, um, that we found in, in the third chapter is to be rooted and grounded in love. To be rooted and grounded in love. And I think about that and how, how important it is for us to, to 
be rooted and grounded in love because there's a lot of things that come our way that just ticks us off. We can use a different word, start with <coughs> me, okay? But it ticks us off. It gets to, our, gets to us, right? A lot of things. And before we know it, we're kind of acting like the old man. We're behaving like the old man and instead of just, uh, you know, we got to let it go. Let it go. There's a lot of things as Christians we can hang on to, isn't there? A lot of things. And if we attempt to hang on to those, well, then they're kind of like self-defeating. They defeat you by hanging on to them. You know, that's kind of stupid, isn't it? It's like, okay, I've got this, I got this disease and I, I want to hang on to it, but you know it's not good for you, but you, you don't want to let go of it. We've got to let go of it. And so when we do that, then, then we're better as a human being. We're, we're actually being obedient. And, and the greatest example of letting go of what really bugs you is Jesus on the Christ, okay, where they're killing an innocent man. You know, I could call down 10,000 angels and just slay everybody right now, but Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. What an example to have. Oh, yeah, well, he said, well, it was easier for him because he was God. No, he was hu fully human too. Let me tell you what, he wanted to reach out and punch somebody in their face. Trust me, okay? You know what I'm talking about. Just want, sometimes you get upset and you just want to punch somebody. You ever, you ever, ever had that feeling? I know you've never had that feeling. I'm just, I just want to, you know. <coughs> and then we kind of started on chapter 4, and chapter 4 is actually where there's unity within the body. And not only is there unity within the body, but as we move further into chapter 4, we talk about that even in the body, even though there's unity, there's diversity, but that diversity works towards unity. Okay. So what, what it, the Bible, what we're going to learn is the fact that we can have diverse, diversity within the body of Christ, but yet even with that diversity, there's unity. In fact, that diversity works towards the unity and the overall purpose of what God is doing in the world today. And you're going to find out something really special. Because I'm going to hopefully bring something to the table that you may have never even thought about. We're going to get there. Okay? But the first few verses of chapter 4, 1 through 6, talked about the fact that within the, in the body of Christ, within the kingdom of God, we have one body, which generally refers to the universal church or to what we would call the Catholic Church. Not the Roman Catholic Church, okay? Because that never even took place until well after a thousand years after Christ's death, burial, resurrection, and ascension, okay? But the universal church, in the early centuries of Christianity, um, and if you look at the early church fathers, they called Christians the Catholic Church, but it didn't mean Catholic so much as far as Roman Catholic. It meant universal. The word Catholic means universal, the universal church. That means the, the Christians. Actually, Christians are a sect of Judaism. What is Judaism? Okay, it's, we are, we've been grafted in. Judaism is uh, the individuals who believe in the law in the Old Testament only, all right? Every disciple, as well as Jesus Christ, the Messiah, were Jewish. And when they started, when, when Jesus was crucified, buried, was raised again by God the Father, and then ascended into heaven, people started to believe that he was the Messiah. In fact, they had proof that he was the Messiah, and they started doing what he said. If you love me, you'll follow my commandments. And it was called the way. So in Judaism, what you had back in the first century, you had the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Essenes. You had several other offshoots of Judaism, but then you had the way. 
The majority, the majority of those Christians, and they weren't called Christians until Antioch, okay? Up until that point in time, they were called away, and the Apostle Paul, who was used to be the Pharisee Saul, sought out those that believed in Christ who were, quote, following the way of Judaism, that sect of Judaism that believed in the way, that sect of Judaism that believed in Jesus. Now we call them Masonic Jews, do we not? They're, they believe they're still Jewish in, in, in a lot of things they do, but they believe in Jesus Christ as the means by which one uh, is brought back into right relationship with God. And, and so they, they were the way. And so actually Christianity, if you really want to think about it, is a sect of Judaism. We, we don't get rid of the Old Testament. The Old Testament is our history and how God has worked through the Jewish people and has brought us to a place of knowing that the scripture, the revelation is not what saves, okay? It's the author of the revelation that saves, Unfortunately, Jewish people still hold the written word, okay, in and of itself, the Torah. The Torah is perfect. No, the Torah is truthful about what is perfect or who is perfect or the truth. There's nothing magical about this Bible. It's just paper and ink and looks pretty, doesn't it? But it's truthful about the truth. The word was with God in the beginning. John, we can go back to John chapter 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning, you know, was God and the word was with God and the word was God and then the word became flesh and dwelt among us, uh, dwelt among men. Jesus Christ is the personification of the Old Testament. He's the personification of the Torah. He said, I didn't come to abolish law, Torah, instruction, but I came to fulfill it. He's the personification. And, and I want to dwell on that because that's the uniqueness of this all. We have one body, we have one spirit, we have one hope, we have one Lord, we have one faith, we have one baptism, and we have one God the Father who is the sovereign ruler over everything. And that God the Father, God in himself has chosen to reveal himself in the Old Testament as God the Creator. In the New Testament, he's chosen to reveal himself as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. An analogy in which we can certainly comprehend. Amen? And that kind of brings up, us up to verse 7. <laughs> I'm going to tell you what, verse 7 is heavy. Somebody read Ephesians chapter 4, 7 through 11. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he led captives in his train and gave gifts to men. What does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. Go ahead, 311. Yeah. Okay. It was he who gave some to be apostles some to be prophets, and some to be evangelists, and to some to be pastors and teachers. Amen. So for the next several weeks, we're probably going to be really digesting this. And this is, um, if you look at, oh, maybe a book of hard sayings of the Bible, this portion of scripture is in there, and we're going to take a look at that, okay? Because sometimes it has been <coughs> interpreted incorrectly in the past. And so we're going to take a look at what we would feel is the most appropriate interpretation of the scripture, especially when it comes to he ascended and he descended. All right. There's, there's quite, a, quite a few variations out there in reference to what theolog theologians would interpret that to be. But as we know from our class of credentials that the meaning is in the text. 
and that if we take a look at the text and compare it to other right. texts, we can come up with a clear understanding and interpretation of difficult sayings in the Bible. But this first part isn't. But, you know, the Apostle Paul uses that word, but, a lot. And I think that's where we start this morning with that word, but. First of all, we, had, we were talking about this unity, one spirit, one God, one baptism, and all this stuff, and how we have. And that is all generic to each and every one of us. You're, the Holy Spirit that dwells in you, Brother Fred, is the same Holy Spirit that dwells in me. When the Holy Spirit tells you no, he instructs you correctly, and when he tells me no, he instructs me correctly. And there's no difference between his no to you and his no to me. He doesn't tell you one thing and then turns around and tells me a different thing. No, he is a true representation. He is the word that's indwelling within me. He is my, he is the, the comforter that has come. Jesus said, I got to go. Jesus was held in time and history because he was fully man. He could only be at one spot at one time. You know, it wasn't like he could, he could be in the Middle East and over, and over, you know, Revealing himself to the American Indian at that time, okay? It, it, that it just he couldn't be but one place. Just like you can only be at one place at one time. And so he said, "I got to go, so the Comforter may come, and the Comfort is going to what? Bring you wisdom, bring you knowledge, lead you, lead you in the ways of righteousness, etc. Give you strength to say yes instead of and overcome your no's." And he's with each and every one of us. Now, you don't have the Holy Spirit until you've accepted Jesus Christ. And then when you accept Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit indwells you. And he's there to encourage you to become like Christ. Okay, to be obedient to the commandments of Jesus Christ. He's there to make sure that whatever you choose to do, whether it's thought and deed or if it's just thought that it's productive thought. And that productive thought, if changed into behavior, becomes productive behavior, that it builds you up instead of destroys you. And that if, if and, and, and when you look at the Greek words and the verbs and things like this, and you get into the original language, it's very easy to determine, and it's very easy to see that salvation is a lifestyle, not just a one, one, one and done moment in time. And, and we've used the analogy of marriage that my wife and I, our marriage ceremony was 41, will be 42 years ago this year on the 27th of August. But 41 years plus some odd months, my wife and I chose to become married. And ever since then, we have been married and we've been abiding in that marriage. We've been participants in that decision. Okay. And our, our motive and our method and our, in our madness, so to speak, okay, our decisions have been not to tear each other down but to build each other up. Our decisions have not been such that we should be counterproductive in this participation but to be productive in it, okay? And... and, and and our, our decision is that, that basically what we want is that we want to have this relationship from now and forever. See, actually, we used to say until death do us part, but that's kind of like so negative, isn't it? Mm -hmm. And so, and that was the old king. And then, and then we also, when I got married, maybe, maybe when you, I plight thee my trough. What in the world does plight thee my trough mean? Huh? <laughs> How many of you plight in a trough lately, huh? Is that what you guys did? Plight thee my trough? Huh? <coughs> Anybody want to explain? That's a hard saying right there, right? That's a hard saying. I don't know if you're all listening on the radio today, but when you got married, did you plight thee your, your spouse? Did you plight thee their trough or your trough? You know, what, what does that mean? And so basically, I kind of changed some things up to where it made sense. I says. Uh, you know, and, and I, I give you myself from now and forever. Okay? 
and therefore in faith I give you my love. The, the, the statement that I use to get rid of, I plight thee my trough. Okay. I don't know about you, but I like plight and troughs. <laughs> oh. Yeah, you go look that one up, okay? Come back next week. That's your homework. Come back next week and tell me what it means to plight thee the, my trough, okay? The word but changes, and it changes from this aspect that as individuals we all have one, but actually there were seven of them, wasn't there? There's seven, we have one what? One body, that count, that's one. One spirit, that's two. One hope, that's three. One Lord, that's four. One faith, that's five. One baptism, that's six. And one God the Father, that's seven. Seven ones equal perfect unity. Seven is the number of perfect. And we all have one body. We're all part of the universal church. We all have one spirit. The Holy Spirit dwells in us. And the Holy Spirit that dwells in you is the same Holy Spirit that dwells. We have hope. We have common hope. We have one hope. What is our one hope? That when we die, God does what he does. God does what he does best, and God does what he said. He will resurrect us because we're not, more, we're not immortal. We're mortal beings. We have no ability to, to give ourselves life. God's the one that does that. Okay. So a little little lit. I let a little air out of your balloon. I had to really slow on that one. <laughs> we have one faith. It's, it's both objective and subjective. It's, we have faith in something that's objective. All right? And that is that the word of God is true. This is truthful about the truth. Jesus is exactly who he said he was, who he is, and will always be. One baptism, that is, our actions are evident of our faith. That's what baptism, that's the first thing that you do, uh, you know, is to say, I want to get baptized because it's symbolic of the old man passing and the new man coming and it's symbolic of getting rid of the dead and becoming alive in Christ and it's no longer that me it's no longer me that liveth but Christ that liveth in me okay it's symbolic of this new relationship where you once used to be disobedient now you're obedient where where your addiction were to was to the created to something or someone that was created and now your addiction is to the creator huge difference there folks and, and so we all have this in common, but there's something that's in the body of Christ that we may not have in common, and it's the diversity. It's that diversity, but we use that diversity not to cause issues within the body, but to continue to maintain the unity within the body and to grow the body. But we've seen it before cause division, the diversities. We've seen, and he said, what is diversities? Well, be patient, we're going to get there. So that word, this transitional word, it, it actually means in spite of that, in spite of the fact that you have seven ones and it's all perfect unity, in spite of what we just say that there's there's one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who is in all, above all, and through all, and over all, okay? In spite of that, we have this diversity. And if you look around this group, we're all in unity, but we're very diversified, are we not? But it's not your height. And let me just say this, because I've developed a way of saying it without really being offensive. Whether you're short or tall, thick or thin, light or dark, speak with an accent or not. Okay? As the believers, we're all the same. Amen? 
I had people bring out facts this week when I was dealing with them on the, and I have what we call an internet church. People, hey, Reverend, what do you think about this? What do you think about this? And, and I find it to be very fulfilling because, I mean, people aren't getting what you're getting. They're not. And they're just, they're just like sponges soaking it in. It's, what, what do you think about this? And I'll share, well, I never thought about it that way. Well, I said, where do you live? Minnesota. I says, well, that's a long bus trip, but you can get here every Sunday if you want. You know, I wish you were closer so that we could fellowship. I feel this bond and this peace and it's so a uniqueness. And it's a brother in Christ. If I was walking down the street, I would say, well, this is my brother. They'd say, hey, no way, because it was like the movie where... Um, one was black and one was white. What was that movie? <laughs> Twins or whatever? I don't know. Look at I don't see people from their heritage. I don't see them from their skin. I don't see them from... I see them either in Christ or not in Christ. I see them either not condemned or condemned. I see them either as believers or unbelievers. And if, in fact, they're unbelievers or in their self-condemnation, I want to help them. I'm not, I'm not here saying, oh, look at me. I got my act together. Wish you had yours act together. I'm just talking about it. I know people are being disobedient, but it makes me sad. I don't want to lord it over them. I want them to have the peace that I have in Christ Jesus. And so there's, there's, there's this diversity, and he says, but to each one of us, grace has been given. In spite of this unity, it, it, on the one hand, we have this unity, but on the other hand, we have this diversity because grace has been given to each and every one of us. And it's a grace which is not a saving grace. We, well, let's talk about saving grace. Grace is a singular word or a single word, and its definition is the gospel, isn't it? Basically. I mean, if you, if grace is, it's, it's all about the gospel. We defined last year, we defined for you a definition which I believe is really biblical in reference to grace because we know that there's this hyper grace out there which is leading people astray. We won't get that. We won't get into that right now. That's one of the subjects I got into with another individual. I said, well, well, what is hyper grace? And I discussed it with him and he said, oh, that makes sense that it's not biblical. So God in love. The Bible says God is gracious, and we know that God is gracious in the sense of his analogies, the analogy, God so loved the world. That in itself is grace, is it not? So let's, let's talk about God in love providing all of humanity the opportunity to participate in his game plan of salvation. A plan and an opportunity which you don't deserve nor do nor have you earned. Let me go through that one more time. God in love provides you all, provides you, provides all of humanity from the very first, first person who lived to the very last person who will live. God provides this opportunity to participate in his game plan of salvation, an opportunity which you've not earned nor do you deserve. Now, first of all, in order to experience God's grace, we must first experience his mercy. But mercy without grace would, end, would, would result in an evil God. Okay? Okay? And God's not evil. God is loving. And in his lovingness, he provides mercy, which is the opportunity for you not to receive God's wrath, something that you have earned and something you deserve. Now, it's really, it's really hard for us to understand that. If we only choose to be disobedient once, we're no longer perfect, are we? Hmm? 
And, and we can't totally comprehend it because we give people many, many opportunities to screw up. We just don't condemn them immediately. But the very first time you said no, you were diso to obedience, you became disobedient, you became broken. And it, it, the easiest way I can say this is that if you just picture a perfect Humpty Dumpty sitting on the wall, it only took one fall to make him broken, right? Only, only took one fall. You don't get up on the wall, fall down ten times, so I'm finally broken now. No, you're just more broken. <laughs> and, and that's what happens in our, in our living, is that the more disobedient we become, the more broken we become. The more immoral we become, the more... the worse off we become. And then, and then we try to attempt to somehow convince ourselves that, Brother Dwayne, we're not broken. Everybody else is broken. I'm not broken. What makes you think I'm broken? Just take a look at you. You're broken. And that's kind of the way we say it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you Christians. <laughs> oh, you Christians. You're so unloving. You're so narrow-minded. You're so... You, you have no diversity. There's no... Truth is narrow. <laughs> you, holy, well, you can be. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, good, good thing she's looking at me, man. <laughs> so the gospel is a good news. It's this opportunity to participate in God's plan of salvation. But I, I, I want you to understand that that grace is God in love providing this opportunity to participate. Now, sometimes we stop with just that thought. We have the opportunity to participate. And we stop with the thought that I'm now in the kingdom. I can just stop. And that's saving grace. That's grace that God has given us for salvation. But there's more grace to be had. In this sense, there's enabling grace. So once you're in this plan of salvation, once you become a participant, you just don't stop. There's now something special for you. Something special for you. And it's not really something special for you, but you're going to be something special in the kingdom. In the kingdom. The nature of grace is giving, and the Bible tells us much more about giving than getting, because God's nature is to give. And think about this. When we're in the world, it was getting. When we're in the kingdom, it's giving. And when we do marriage counseling, we, we go to, again, Ephesians, the book of unity, it talks about how to get along in various relationships. One of them is a marriage relationship. And it tells a man, hey, don't worry about the relationship. Just worry about what you're supposed to do within the relationship. And it tells the wife, don't worry about relationship. Just do what you're supposed to do within relationship. And your relationship will have unity. So it doesn't focus on the relationship. It focuses on the individuals within the relationship. And once you do that and once you become biblical in your relationships within a marriage, that marriage starts clicking. Starts clicking. I, can, I tell people all the time, I can guarantee when somebody comes to me for a marriage counseling, either one or both are out of the will of God. And they probably don't even know it. Because they have this other concept. They have the concept of what the world has provided instead of the concept of what God provides. And the concept that God provides is simply an attitude of giving. <whistles> giving. Grace has nothing to do with anything. We have done or have failed to do. It can only be received. And God is gracious because he is the one who gives grace. He is the one, not because of who we are, but because of who he is. He gives us grace. His grace is therefore unmerited. It's unearned. It's undeserved. 
it depends entirely on the one who gives it. That is our, uh, the grace that I, that I personally experience and the love that I personally experience, the mercy that I personally experience as an individual within the body of Christ is not something because of me, but because of God. All right? This grace is God's self-motivation, self-generate. It's self-motivated. It comes from God's very personal character. It's self-motivated, it's self-generated, and it's a sovereign act of his giving. That's his part within this plan of salvation, the opportunity to participate. Jesus was on the cross, and he did the second really most important act of history by saying, it is finished. The first one, it's created, then all the way from created. Dwayne, you know what I'm talking about. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Uh, um, Jill, you know what I'm talking about. The next act is it's finished, and that means that there's now a method by which we can participate via grace and faith. It takes two to tangle here, okay? God's part is done. Our part is continuously being done. Yes? Part of that participation is surrendering. Surrendering, okay, so let's talk about that, okay? The second thing concerning grace is self-giving grace. Self-giving grace. God's grace has another dimension that places it still further above every other kind of giving. The greatest gift of grace is self. He not only gives, us, he gives blessings to men, but he gave himself infinitely more important and precious than blessings, God gives us that gift of himself. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He gave his son. His son is our blessing. His son is the evidence of grace. And his son being obedient even under death, his son was the blessing. He not only provided blessing, but he himself was the blessing. Jesus doesn't only provide peace, but he is our peace. Amen. He is the personification of the grace and the calling that God had in his life for us. Why didn't Jesus get involved with social? Why wasn't he a, um, what, do you, what do you call somebody who gets involved socially, an individual who marches or whatever? Yeah. Protester. A protester or not a protester, but just he wasn't socially active in the things of his day and age. You know, if he was asked a question, he would give a logical and rational answer that, you know, would be correct. Activist. activist. He wasn't a social activist. Okay? He wasn't a religious bigot. In other words, he would challenge you on your beliefs. He would enlighten you. He would with this enlightenment, attempt to restore you, reconcile you with the purpose of relationship. A religious bigot is one who basically is a self-righteous individual who lords their, their, their right standing with God over you. And to, to put you down, it's just a religious way of, of lifting themselves up. And it's just underneath the guise of God. Okay? Okay. He, he, he wasn't involved in governmental actions or trying to somehow establish a government that would be um, more perfect. He was involved in one reason. He was God's gift to humanity for the purpose of making it possible for man to come back into a right relationship with the Holy God. Sinful man to come back into a right relationship with the Holy God. His only purpose was to become the Savior of the world. And it wasn't that he came to do a job, it was he came to give himself. His job was to die. 
Has your pastor ever asked you to die? Get out of here. I will someday. Huh? I will someday. Well, I know you're going to die someday. But have I ever come to you and said, your job is to die for Bethel Christian Fellowship? <laughs> you might say, we, well, we've got an annual meeting coming up. We're going to find us a new pastor. <laughs> We'll take a vote on that one, won't we? When, you know, let, let's just say, okay, that Jesus had to get dressed before he came to earth. First of all, the first thing that Jesus had to do was take some of his godliness off. He had to set some of that aside. Not, he set it aside so that he could be totally human. Okay, he strapped on his boots. You know, he set, he set aside his all-knowingness. And the reason he did that is because as a human being, we were not all-knowing. If we were all-knowing, we wouldn't need faith, would we? And so in order for him to be fully human, he had to rely on faith. He had to rely on faith in God his Father. So he set aside some of his godliness, so to speak, some of his godly character, that didn't make him less than God. You know, to be less than God, you have to eliminate your godly character. And, and God can't even eliminate his godly character. He can, set, he can choose to set it aside. Just as he chooses, and we can know this analogy in the sense that he knows you've sinned, but he chooses not to remember your sin. Okay? He chooses to forget. You think God can forget? No, he has to choose to forget. I forget, and I don't choose to forget. I just forget. I, you, you, you don't? Okay, well, look it. I got gray hair. When you get gray hair, forgetness is part of it. <laughs> it you're like an elephant? You remember everything? I take these little capsules for memory. But Do you? I can't remember what they're called. <laughs> <laughs> and, and you don't remember where you put them. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's why his memory's so bad. <laughs> if he would just take those pills. Yeah. What about our trough? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's where the pill is. It's in the trough. <laughs> Uh, so there's another dimension of grace, and that other dimension is not just saving grace, which brings you into the kingdom, but it's also that grace in which is self-giving. Self-giving grace. <coughs> and so the diversity within the kingdom, there's unity there, but the diversity is that each and every one of us <coughs> must be self-giving. Self-giving. All right. Jesus is our example. He gave himself. He didn't come talk about how you should do it or how this, or this, and you know, if we just did this, well, then this would work, and... No, he gave himself. He was the example, the personification of grace and diversity even within the kingdom of God. And I want you to focus on this because this is, this is good stuff. Okay? And I'll explain it to you here just in a moment. Maybe, not this week it looks Grace is there for God's self-donation, and he donated himself. He not only gives blessings to men, he gives himself. The, this is kind of incomprehensible, and in, in, in in it's, it's a staggering truth of the gospel, is that the holy God of the universe has given himself to sinful men, not to people who deserve it, but to people who don't deserve it. He came while we were yet sinners. just totally, I can't even put my mind around that. <clears throat> he gave himself, he, he, you know, he didn't come and give you a lottery ticket. He was a lottery ticket. He is a lottery ticket. He is that which makes it worthwhile. Amen? 
God grants us his salvation, his kingdom, his inheritance, his spirit, his throne, his wisdom, his love, his power, his peace, his glory, and every other spiritual blessing as we studied in the first chapter of Ephesians. Those are our spiritual blessings. We have them all, but we have them for a specific purpose, not just to somehow experience this grace of salvation, but to experience this grace of self-giving. Oh, man, I'm going to raise the bar here, okay? It's far more. Our call is far more than just we've got those blessings, and he blesses us with his personal presence. God owes us nothing, owes sinful man nothing except judgment for their sinfulness and for their disobedience. He he does not owe men nothing. A, the smallest blessing of blessings or any favor whatsoever. He, he doesn't owe us anything. God, when he, when he made the decision to give a son, he could see that the world was in sin, but yet he chose to give himself to the sinful world through his own son in order that this world might be redeemed, brought back into our right relationship with him. The son, in addition to that, not only did God give him, his son, but his son gave himself. Okay? Gave himself. He, he, he didn't negotiate somehow with God to say, okay, well, look, at if, if I do everything right for 15 years, then you'll redeem men. No, that wouldn't work. God had to, Jesus had to give himself to, to build this bridge between sinful men and a holy God. He gave himself throughout his entire ministry. Now, when you think about unity and you think about the diversity of the callings that God places on the lives of individuals within that unified church, only one person has had that specific calling of bringing sinful man, making it possible for a sinful man to come back into a right relationship with God, and that was Jesus Christ. Now, he didn't come to negotiate with Satan a peace treaty between God the Father, or God, and Satan. He, he didn't negotiate. He was the element of, of negotiation. He, he was that elements. So when God gave him this gift, this gift be a grace. It was him. He. The calling was him. The calling was that he had to give of himself to fulfill that calling within the plan of God's salvation. So it was self-giving. He gave himself to his disciples, to those he healed, to those he raised from the dead, released from demons, and forgave sins. He gave himself. So we've talked about, I mean, we're just talking about this very first verse, but... The reason we're talking about it so much is because there's this transition. There's, on the one hand, in spite of this unity, there's diversity within the, within the body, and there's diversity because God gives you as a gift to the body, just as he gave his son as a gift to the body. You, you receive a gift from God, but that gift is inner twined with you. You're the gift to the body. All right? Just as God's gift to sinful men was Jesus, and Jesus' <coughs> gift was, was to fulfill the calling in his life, you have a calling on your life, and the only way that you can fulfill that calling is by giving yourself to that calling. Mm-hmm. All right? You're the personification of that calling. You might say, well, God has given me the gift of healing. No. 
when you walk in the room, you are the healing who has faith in God to allow it to happen in the life of somebody else. You're the personification of that gift. I want you to know that God has, you make it happen because God enables you to make it happen. All right? God enables. I can't make anything happen in the family of God. God enables me to make it happen. And next week we're going to talk about that. The enabling grace. The enabling grace. Now, I'll just leave you with this thought for clarification. You know I've told you my story. You know I've told you how God laid on my heart to go to Bethel and be a blessing. And when you think about that, I didn't come here to help bless people. I came personally to be a blessing. Okay? You come personally to be a blessing. When I walk into a person's house, I'm not there Okay, to bring blessing, I am the blessing. Now, I don't get big-headed on that because, let me put it this way, God enables me, Brother Tom, to be the blessing. Okay, without him enabling me, I have no abilities, what period, so what. But when you understand yourself, that you're in the body of Christ, who you are in Christ, and that God has given you a specific duty to do within the body, you become the personification of that duty, just as Christ gave himself, you must give yourself to be able to perform that duty. And it takes on a whole new light. You know that? It takes on a whole new light. Isn't that beautiful? It is. Huh? Do you see how special you are? God has a specific calling for you, a specific gift for you. And it's not that somehow you just perform it, but you become it. And that's why I tell people who refused my help, I tell them, don't rob me of a blessing. Because that's what they're doing. If they refuse. And if you choose not to do it, you're robbing them of a blessing as well as yourself as a blessing. Okay? So you're actually, and we're going to get into it. It's too good. But I think we're all diversified. We all have different, we're all parts of the body. And we're diversified in that, but we all have unity. But we all have a calling. But you don't just do a calling. You are the calling. Amen. Amen. Jesus didn't come to somehow satisfy the righteous requirements of God through negotiation. No, he came to give himself so that he would satisfy the righteous requirements of a holy God. It was his calling and he, it was personified in him and he had to give of himself in order for that calling to be activated within the body of Christ. So we're going to talk about it. When I say I came to be a blessing doesn't mean I was going to bless. I... I had to be the blessing. I have to be self-giving. I have to say no to self and yes to whatever God asks me to be a blessing. And I, I just can't turn me off as a blessing and turn me on as a blessing. Okay? I is what I is. I am that I am. <laughs> okay? And I can't change that. We're going to talk about how, how God has chosen something special for you and how you become that specialness to others. And that's who you are in Christ. And nobody can take your place. Nobody can. You know, Jill came and she's doing all this stuff today and because Dan's not here, but she can't take Dan's place. Nor does he want to. You can't take my place and I can't take your place. We're diversified within the body and we've got to get on with what we're supposed to be doing so that we can not what, continue unity within this body but also grow the body. Grow the body. 
You're special. You're unique. There's only one like you. God has given you a special calling. But you're the calling. But he's given you a special grace and ability to act in a certain way within the body. You are the one that has to act. So beautiful. And once we catch sight of the fact that you don't go just be a blessing, but you're the blessing that goes, there's, it's a whole new ball game. It's a whole new ball game. Amen? Amen. Say it with me. I'm a blessing. I don't just provide blessings, but I am the blessing personified. Amen? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this word. We trust that it will encourage individuals to understand that they're just more than a tool that you use, but you're, they're the actual instrument, the vessel that you work through to bless others. And we'll give you the praise, honor, and glory for it. In the name of Jesus, amen. amen. So next week we're going to start with the third thing concerning grace, enabling grace. Grace not only saves, but it enables us to do something within the body of Christ. So we're in the kingdom. We're participating in it now, right? We're not just married to God. We're participating in that marriage, and God enables us to do it. So we'll talk about that next week. We hope you've enjoyed this broadcast. You've been listening to Rightly Dividing the Word of Truth with Pastor Gary Belk from Bethel Christian Fellowship in Lakewood, Colorado. To hear more, please visit itswritten.org. And don't forget to tune in next week. God bless you.